I'm not sure who you're talking of. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to excuse me, ladies. I can see the shocked look on some of the faces here. You're not used to seeing this uniform during your little parties. So I will beg your, your forgiveness before I even start. My name is Daniel Murray, and I am a soldier. As you can tell by the sound of my voice, I am not a man of Mississippi. But this is true. I was born in the year of our Lord, 1836, in County Cork, Ireland. I came to this country looking for a better way of life. When I first came to the United States, I was living in the city of New York. I had a job driving a wagon. I was a teamster, you see. Well, life in the big city was not for the likes of me. So on the 10th day of November, 1859, I enlisted in the United States Army. This was long before the war, my dear. I wasn't joining one of the many volunteer regiments that came later. No, I was joining the regular United States Standing Army during a time of peace. Now, would you be knowing the definition of the word peace as it applies to a professional military man like myself? Well, peace is that long pause in the shooting when everyone stops to reload. <laughs> I was assigned to Company C of the 1st Infantry. Well, when I first went to my company, they were off at Fort Cobb in the Choctaw Nation, Indian Territory. The rest of the regiment was away in Texas. For you see, it was our job to be looking after the peaceful Eastern Indians who had gone west on the Trail of Tears. For there were those in Texas who didn't like the Eastern Indians. Now there were the Texans, they didn't like the Choctaws. And then there were the Comanche and they didn't like anyone. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the old 1st Infantry was a fine, proud outfit with a history stretching back to 1791. The men that came before me fought the English in 1815 at New Orleans and gave a great Beaten to the Redcoats that fine day. <laughs> You'll have to pardon me, Gloden. It comes easy for an Irishman talking about beating English. It happens. <laughs> it happens so often, you know. Later, the regiment was with Zachary Taylor during the Mexican War and helped to capture Monterey down in old Mexico. We had a fine, good captain. A Massachusetts man he was, a West Pointer by the name of Joseph Plummer. A fine man, but he was often sick. And while he was away, we were commanded by 2nd Lieutenant William Burnett, a native-born Texican. He was our true commander, and he taught each of us to be a crack shot, and how to fight with the bayonet after the French style, using the bayonet like a great sword. Oh, there were some fine lads in old Company C. Many like myself from Ireland, but there were men from Switzerland and Germany, England, even a few from the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's true that, that in those days, most of the men in the army were from the old country, and it was a good job for those who couldn't get better. But all of that changed, mind you, after the war began. It was just a, an old tale that the wives tell, that the Union Army was nothing more than foreigners and hired mercenaries. Dash the thought furthest from the truth. Truth of the matter was, three out of every four men who wore the blue was a native-born American. And the others? Well, they were like myself. Americans, but just a little later getting here. others. Oh, good fine lads in that company. Now when I joined, when I enlisted, it was for finding a better job than the one I had. For I can assure you in my line of occupation driving the wagon that that view right in front of you, <laughs> it never gets any better. <laughs> but once the war began, oh, Every man and boy wanted to join. 
after Fort Sumter, they couldn't sign up fast enough. It was all about patriotism. It was exciting. They all knew it was the most exciting thing that had ever happened or would ever happen in their life. They didn't want to miss out on the fun. The fun. And there were others with fool notions of romance, chivalry, those that had been raised on the novels of Sir Walter Scott, growing up with, with Ivanhoe and King Arthur and Robin Hood. Yeah, the horrors of war hit those men the hardest. But there were others excited to join. They didn't want to be left behind. Everyone was going. Everyone in the village, they didn't want to stay behind. Others, they just thought it was the only way they'd ever have to get off of the farm. Now later, those who wouldn't enlist, oh, they were shamed for it. They were asked to be showing their petticoats. <laughs> <laughs> they would come home and they would find a white feather tacked to the door. Being accused of being a coward could be a strong spur to a man who wouldn't wear the blue. And it wasn't just the men in the neighborhood who did the shaman. The women. <laughs> Oh, they could be cruel harpies to a man who wouldn't wear the blue. <laughs> now, when the war began, we left the Indian Territory, stopped briefly in Kansas, and then on to Missouri. I fought in the Battle of Springfield, which many call Wilson's Creek. It was a dark and terrible day. I lost 15 good comrades, brothers from Company C. Well, we did no fighting under our old commander, Lieutenant Burnett. For you see, before, just as the war was started, he resigned his commission and went to the other side. Well, I want you to think on this for a moment. It's a funny thing. An officer could resign his commission at any time and go to the other side and no one gave it another thought. But if an enlisted man, such as myself, if I was to become a Confederate, and they captured me, they'd call me a traitor and I would be shot. Now I ask you to find the justice in that. <sighs> Captain Plummer returned to us, hale and hearty. And we got a new lieutenant, a fine young lad from Delaware, Henry Robinette. Now we did no more fighting for nine long months. And then they put us on the steamboats and sent us up the Tennessee River to Hamburg Landing just up the stream from Pittsburgh Landing, the site of that, that great battle many call Shiloh. Now we missed that fight, but having personally looked at the field after the battle, I can assure you I'm very glad that we missed it. While we were there, on the 20th day of April, the War Department put the 1st Infantry right on our ear. They told us, put away your muskets, you're no longer the infantry, you are now the artillery. The artillery! Say it's preserve us! <laughs> <laughs> they gave us the big 20 and 30 pound parrot rifles, told us we were the siege artillery, and so we were. Now we did our part in the siege of Corinth, Mississippi. Truth be told, it was the first infantry that won the town. <laughs> well, we did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All through the long month of May, the Union Army got closer and closer to the town. Until finally, on the 29th day of May, the first infantry with our big 30 pound pair of rifles. We're on the heights, two miles away, mind you. And we fired five shells that landed right at the railroad crossroads. Oh boy, oh, that was some funny shooting. The next morning, we got up and the Confederates were all gone. Now I'm not saying all the others didn't do their part, but there's no denying they didn't leave till the first infantry joined the fight. <laughs> We became part of the garrison of Corinth, our job to protect the town if the Confederates were ever to return. Captain Plummer, 
was promoted to a brigadier general and then died of disease, poor man. Lieutenant Robinette became our captain, and no finer man there was than he. We built a small fort on the west side of the town, and we called it Battery Robinette after himself. One of seven forts around the railroad crossroads, all manned by the old companies of the 1st Infantry. As I said, to protect the town in case the Confederates returned, and return they did. It was on the third day of October, on a day as hot as blazes, and they came out of the northwest. All day long the fighting came closer and closer and closer to the town, until right before sunset. They were no more than half a mile away, and we fired several shots from our 20-pound parrot rifles. As fierce of a piece of weaponry as there ever was. <laughs> we were just letting them know that Company C was in the fort. Well, that evening, the big generals, they reorganized the army, and all around us in the fort was an entire brigade of Ohio troops. Fine, sturdy Buckeye lads they were. Thousands of them, but they had nothing to fear. Company C was there to protect them. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were most rudely awoken at four o'clock in the morning. Artillery raining down all amongst us. We didn't know it at the time, but the artillery was being directed by none other than our old commander, Lieutenant Burnett. Yeah. Him now a Confederate <laughs> major. For when he had gone to the other side, he became the chief of artillery for General Sterling Price. He has 12 cannons on the ridge, all shooting at the fort, and him knowing every man Jack of us was there. <laughs> well, we didn't put up for that nonsense for too long. We began to fire our 20-pounders, Battery Williams across the way, joining in with a 30 and 64-pounders, and in no time at all, they had to take their cannons away. They brought in the horses and limbers, hooked up the cannons, and hauled them off to sea. All that is but one. One cannon was left behind. The horses had all been killed. They took, couldn't take it off. As the morning came, and the bright sun was reflecting off of that bright bronze barrel, every man on the hill could see it. It was like a a prize, a trophy, just out there, 300 yards away. A prize waiting to be taken, and it was too much for a dozen men of the 63rd Ohio to our right. And these 12 men went running across to get the cannon. Well, the Confederates weren't going to just let them take it. <laughs> they were shooting at them from the trees. <laughs> they got all the way to the cannon, but the firing was too much, and they had to come back running back to our lines. Now, during the entire adventure, Company C was doing our part to help. We were standing on the walls, cheering them on. <laughs> but when they came back, I cannot rightly say how it happened. There was myself, Joe Plasky, Mike Ryan, Pat Mead. Someone smiled. It was a wink, a nod. And before you could say Jack Robinson, all four of us are over the walls, across the ditch, and running for that cannon. <laughs> oh, what was I thinking? I wasn't scared. Of course, I was excited. I could hear me, me heart pounding in me ears. There's dust being kicked up by the bullets all around us. What well, seemed like forever, we finally got to the cannon, and we got the great beast turned around with two of us on the wheels and with two of us on the trail, we put our backs to it. I said a quick prayer to St. Barbara. <laughs> with all I had, I pushed. And foot by foot, yard by yard, we brought it all the way to the fort. Oh, you should have heard the noise, the hallooing and the huzzahing, <laughs> throwing their caps in the air, patting us on the back. And all I could think of is what a daft thing we had just done. <laughs> well, there was little time for celebrating. We knew the Confederates would soon attack. And soon they did. 
the charge came. They came out of the trees. But it was like a tr no charge we had ever seen. And it was no trumpets or bugles or drums. No yelling. They came out as if on parade with their flags flying. And we watched them for a bit until we realized their purpose. We began to fire with the 20 pounders. We were firing rounds of canister and then double rounds of canister. Oh, we were tearing great holes in their line, but they would fill the ranks and they kept coming. They got to within a hundred yards, but the firing was too much and they went back to the trees. We knew they'd come again and soon they did, this time at the trot. They got to within 20 yards of the fort and we pushed them back and again they returned to the trees. And as we watched, we could see a man on a black horse riding back and forth in front of them, calling them to try again. And we could see them getting back into line. The third charge, they came at the run as hard as they could, screaming that rebel yell. Have you ever heard it? It makes the hair on your neck stand up, it does. Soon they were within 50 yards of the fort, 10 yards. They were firing through the embrasures. They were climbing the walls and shooting down at us. <clears throat> Half of us were down. The rest of us ran out the back of the fort. But we didn't run away. For you see, there was a plan if there such a calamity were to take place. And as we left the fort, Battery Williams across the way fired two shells right at Battery Robinette. And they fired just above the fort. And in a flash, every man of the fort was down. And we came running back in with our muskets, infantry once again. And we defended our cannon with the bayonet and the rifle butt, driving the enemy from the fort never to return. It was a great victory but not one without terrible price. Of our 26 men, 12 were down, eight wounded, including Lieutenant Robinette, and four dead passed to the other side. A little later in the day, one of the lads took a sharp scribe, and on top of our trophy, our cannon, he carved in to the top of that soft bronze metal and he wrote, captured October 4, 1862, Corinth Miss by 1st U.S. Infantry. Aye. Now, I'm not really sure which one of the lads it was that did the engraving. I wasn't there, you see. But you see, I was one of the dead. I died that day in Battery Robinette. And my comrades buried me just outside of the walls of the fort. And there I rested for four long years, until after the war in 1866, and it was time to move all the Union soldiers to the new National Cemetery. And when it was time to move me, these strangers, well, they found that the wooden headboard that had me name and the unit on it was gone. They didn't know what it was. I was buried in an unknown grave with just a stone and a number over my head. Unknown but to God. There are 3,892 unknown soldiers buried in that cemetery. I am in one of those graves. I am in all of those graves. I am Daniel Murray and I was a soldier of the United States Army. The Park Ranger Tom Parson. <laughs> now the story of Daniel Murray is not something that I just made up. He was a real man in the first infantry, really from Cork, Ireland. And he did die capturing that cannon. Well, he, he died after capturing the cannon. He was one of four. That cannon and that inscription on top of the barrel can be seen today. It's in the lobby 
of the Corinth Civil War Interpretive Center. The first thing people see when they walk through the front door. Daniel is in a grave that's marked unknown, but today, through some research, some, through some documents that we found a little over <coughs> a year ago, we know now where Daniel was buried. It's in section C, grave number 514. And we hope that one of these days we can convince the Veterans Administration to put a real stone with his name and First Infantry over him. By their rules, it takes someone who is uh, part of his family, kin, to do it. And he was a bachelor, no children, and we don't know of any family. So until we can convince them, there's just a number, but we know where he's at. Well, that's my, my tale of Daniel. Uh, but I'd certainly be delighted to answer any questions you might have about him or the center or what I had for dinner last night, anything you want. <laughs> Pardon me, what did you just say about the monument? What is the procedure? Uh, to, to, to get a headstone. To get a headstone. To replace one that already exists or to, to put a new one in. It has to be requested by a member of the family. Yeah. That didn't used to do that. No, but, they, yeah, they, that changed. It, it's been tightened up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we'd have done this two years ago, we'd have yeah. had a stone for him like that. I want to commend you on your accent. <laughs> I have been to Ireland several times, and people who have not do not realize they pronounce a hard T. Like, for think, it's tink. There were thousands of them. I know. <laughs> <laughs> just about all that was really just a about good all of Europe does accent. that. Yeah. Germans can't do it. They can't do the th sound, the th. Yeah. They cannot it, do it. It was a really good presentation. Mm -hmm. really well, well, someone had it right. I watched the Quiet Man over and over. And over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, with our thanks. Well, thank you very much. Always very a delight good. to come and speak to the ladies. Thank you. Very Always. good. Thank you so much.